Well, shall we open our Bibles to our theme text? We are in this series that we've titled Reconnecting to the Old Testament. We are looking at the Word of God as Jesus encouraged us to do and finding Jesus there. The Word of God includes the Old and the New Testaments, and we should not unhitch or disconnect from either of these great uh, uh, things that are given to us by God. We come to John chapter 5 and verse 39, and Jesus is speaking, and he says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, one of the big questions that arose very early in the Christian faith is what about the law of Moses? As the gospel went out, and especially as it went out into the Gentile world, Gentiles were coming to Christ in faith. Uh, We saw that Peter was the one who was used initially to bring the gospel to the centurion uh, and his family and friends, and they came to the Lord, and the Lord saved them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and there was evidence that God was bringing out a people among the Gentiles, and yet they, they were not Jews. And so there was this idea, what about the law of Moses? Are people still supposed to do the sacrifices? Are they still supposed to keep kosher? Are they still supposed to to follow all of these rules? And so the early church had to settle that issue, and they did so with the teachings of uh, the apostles through the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some things in the Old Testament that are no longer binding in the New Testament. Now, we have been... uh, firm to expose the error that some have taught that we should unhitch from the Old Testament and distance ourselves from it and not focus on it and not view it as any, uh, in any way authoritative today. Uh, that's an error. We have called it an error, and it is an error. But as many times is the case, an error or a heresy is not necessarily contradicting a clear teaching of Scripture, but confusing it are taking it beyond the level that is correct. Now, for example, there are some things in the Old Testament that are not binding upon us in the New. But it is a heresy, it is an error to say everything in the Old Testament is no longer binding. That is taking it too far. Much further than Jesus took it, much further than the apostles took it, much further than God himself takes it. Uh, And so before we get into more detail, let's just deal, first of all, with some pertinent scriptures that do teach us that we are now in a new covenant through Christ and that the law is a system that was replaced with something called grace uh, and faith. Okay, Romans chapter 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, this requires further definition, but this is a general statement. The Apostle Paul is writing to believers, and he's saying, you're not under the law, you are under grace. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. Blotting out, speaking of Christ and his, his crucifixion, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, in those days, often they would take the crimes that a person had committed and they would write them on a a parchment and they would nail it to their cross and this was the crime that they were paying for. Uh, And so this was the death that was being paid. Now, they're using this analogy here in Scripture to say that Jesus took the law, the entire ordinances, all of those rules and regulations, he took it and nailed it to his cross. That means the debt had been paid. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Notice, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Now what he's saying here is don't make it an issue and don't let it be made an issue about these things about the law, which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of Christ. <clears throat> now, if you're walking along uh, in the sunlight, you will see your shadow if you look in the right direction. Now, your shadow is not you. Uh, you are you. Your body is you. That is your shadow. And so the Apostle Paul is using this uh, figure of speech, if you will, to talk about the law as compared to Christ. 
the law was a shadow. It was a figure. It was an image. But there is the body, and that is what has come, and that is Christ. Now, let's look also <clears throat> at uh, the understanding that what is the law of Moses? What is the law of Moses? If we're going to say that we're not under the law of Moses, what are we talking about? Well, we talked about last week, it doesn't mean that we are no longer under God's moral laws. God's moral laws have not changed. It is still wrong to commit adultery. It is still wrong to murder. It is still wrong to steal. These things that were given by God for how human beings should live uh, have not changed and will not change. So what is it that did change? Now, that's a fair question, isn't it? If we're going to say, excuse me, that we are unhitching from the Old Testament in this sense, what is it that we are no longer bound by? What is it that we are no longer uh, to consider authoritative in our lives? Now, the moral laws, first of all, are what God gave us in the Old Testament. And these laws were articulated on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. But now before the Ten Commandments were given, did not men already know it's wrong to steal? Yes, they knew it was wrong to steal. Uh, Did they not know it was wrong to murder? Yes, they knew it was wrong to murder. Uh, These things were understood in people's understanding and their faith before it was articulated and put on the Ten Commandments. They knew these things. Uh, People still practiced uh, the Sabbath even before then. It was mandated during the law, but it was understood and recognized in the Old Testament uh, before then. And so uh, the Ten Commandments, for example, are repeated in full force in the New Testament with the exception of the Sabbath. And that is dealt with in particular because it was given to Israel for a purpose. But except for the Sabbath itself, Every one of the Ten Commandments, all the others, are repeated in full force in the New Testament. So it is God's moral laws uh, that are contained in the law of Moses. Uh, All the laws concerning how people should live and how people should conduct their bodies, uh, uh, sexual mores and things of this nature uh, were given in the law of Moses, but they were not invented in the law of Moses and they did not stop with the law of Moses. All right. Now, what's next? ceremonial laws. Those are religious laws. Now, when God began to take the children of Israel, he took them out of Egypt where they were under the different laws and regulations of Egypt. Now, they worshiped Jehovah God, but they were heavily influenced with Egyptian culture as well, as you might understand. So when God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, he gave them rules and regulations so they would not be like Egypt and so that they would not be like the people uh, among whose they were going to be when they went to the Holy Land. All right. <clears throat> so the ceremonial laws uh, were given. Now, by the way, Jesus fulfilled every single one of the ceremonies. He fulfilled every one of the sacrifices. He fulfilled every one of the law. But let's understand what the ceremonial laws were. There were rules regarding places of worship where you could worship and where you you should not. There were prohibitions upon idol worship and other pagan practices. There uh, is a lot of information given about the wrong kind of worship. There were rules regarding the priesthood. Who could be a priest? How do you appoint a priest? How do you establish a priest? What are the qualifications and duties of a priest? Uh, Many chapters are given to this. There's also elaborate and detailed rules for the sacrifices. Uh, The sacrifice had to be a certain type of sacrifice. It had to be offered a certain way. Uh, There were people who were trained in how to do this so it was done properly. It was very detailed and and, and very exhaustive list of the the rules. And also there were rules and regulations about uh, the religious holidays, uh, the different festivals and fasts that they were supposed to do. So there was a whole religious uh, list of things that the children of Israel were supposed to do. And if they didn't do them, then they were not uh, good followers of God. Now, I want to take your attention to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Hebrews is written in particular to demonstrate that the New Testament is superior to the Old. That the faith that is in Christ is the fulfillment of everything that was before just pointing to it. And so the language we see in the book of Hebrews is very rich for this purpose. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Okay, for the law, 
having a shadow, and here's this word shadow again, the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, what the Apostle Paul, and I believe he wrote Hebrews, so whoever wrote it, I believe it was Paul, but the writer of Hebrews, through the Holy Spirit, says these sacrifices could not make someone perfect. They could not make someone complete. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Now, what he's doing is he's saying if if God intended for the Old Testament sacrifices to be what saved you and what cleansed you and what made you for God, then God would have not let them stop. They had stopped. They were no longer being done. All right? Now, for then would they have not ceased to have been offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now, he's uh, referencing in particular the Day of Atonement. This was an annual feast, and they would come every year with an offering, and they would offer it, and their sins were atoned for for a year until the next offering. So they had to do it over and over and over again. Many years go by. If you're 70 years old, uh, perhaps you've been to, uh, you know, uh, decades and uh, dozens of these that went on. And so these sacrifices went on year after year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now this is an interesting concept and we need to understand it if we're going to really understand the difference between the Old and the New Testament. The Bible says that all things are purged with blood. Blood is necessary for atonement. Blood is necessary for salvation. But the blood of bulls and goats will not do it. So none of those sacrifices in the Old Testament washed away a single sin. None of those sacrifices saved a single soul. All they were was pictures that pointed to the one who would do so. And that is the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the only one whose sacrifice is effectual for the cleansing of sin. And so as we look back to the cross in faith, believing on Christ for salvation, they looked forward with their limited, but yet enough was revealed to them that God gave it to them as faith to understand that blood is necessary for redemption. And so all of these sacrifices did not take away sins, but through faith they were saved in that understanding, looking forward to Messiah who would come. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. (coughs) Excuse me. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, that's Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now, the other priest had to stand up, stand up, stand up. There was always more to do, always more sacrifices, always more work, always more lambs, always more bullocks, always more sacrifices, always, 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 always. But when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he went up and ascended to the Father, and he sat down. Now listen, when you've done your work, you can sit down, and he's done it, and he's on the right hand of the Father, having finished forever redemption. So all of these ceremonial laws, listen, when we come to church, we don't have a brass altar somewhere, and you've got to find a lamb somewhere, and and, uh, if you don't have one, you've got to go buy one, and show up here, and we sacrifice that lamb. That's not our worship today. That's not what we do. What do we do? We talk about Jesus. We preach the gospel. We preach the cross. All those things were were shadows and figures of that which was to come. So the ceremonial law is no longer authoritative today. We don't do the sacrifices. We don't go through the ceremonies. We don't have to do the religious holidays if we want. Uh, You can, but you don't have to. It's it's up to you. Uh, The Apostle Paul made that very clear. All right. Now, there were civil laws. Now, these are interesting. When the children of Israel left Egypt, listen, you can't leave a place where they have order and laws and regulations about how to live and then just leave that and go out and just be a people in total chaos. I mean, people have to be governed. They have to have rules of behavior or else they they, they go downhill quickly. Uh, And so all of these uh, children of Israel had to have a government. 
they had to have civil laws, just like you and I do. We can't just do whatever we want. Uh, and so these were statutes and rules for an orderly society. God created a nation, and that nation needed governing. And so he gave them rules through Moses to govern that nation. Now, there were many categories. This is not, by the way, an exhaustive list. Uh, there's many more, but I'm going to mention a few. Uh, jurisprudence, the legal system. God gave Israel uh, a wonderful legal system. Now, let's understand, the legal system as it existed in those days was kind of rough, uh, these were nomads that moved around, uh, headed by families, headed by what we would today per perhaps call tribal she sheiks or chiefs, uh, and sometimes the law was what he said. Uh, now, for instance, if somebody came into your area and either accidentally or on purpose, or maybe there was some question about it, uh, maybe they got in a fight <clears throat> and they killed your, your nephew, okay, what you would do is you would just kill him, and that, that settled it. It was futile that way. Now, that was the culture. That's how they handle things. Well, God created a system whereby if you did something and it was some question about whether you meant it or not, it was an accident, maybe it was just manslaughter, maybe it was just a, an accident that nobody could have foreseen, but because they, they called this fellow the, the, the avenger of death, this man who was appointed to take you out, and that was a thing they had back then, God made cities of refuge where you could go to and he couldn't get you there. You could, you could find safety. And so if you went to that city of refuge, the avenger of death had no authority there. He could not take you there, and they would give you a fair trial. And if they, the, 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 the trial found you guilty, they'd take you back to him. <laughs> but if you were not guilty, you got to live, and uh, the, the issue was settled. So God gave all kinds of laws. Another interesting thing that I think would be good if we did it today, uh, it would, why, would be wise, <clears throat> if you stole something, you had to pay it back. You didn't go to jail and get three meals a day and a bed. If you stole something, you had to pay it back times four. Now, I would think, let's say you're a thief and you'd say, I think I'll just steal something. <clears throat> and you do, and you get caught. And now the law says you've got to pay it back times four. Maybe next time you say, I don't think I'll steal anymore. For one thing, you've learned how to work now because you've had to work to pay off that debt. And working, you found, is a lot easier when you're working for yourself instead of somebody else. It was a good rehabilitation program to turn people into workers instead of layabouts. It wouldn't be bad for the American system. So they had jurisprudence. They had inheritance laws. Uh, by, by the way, one of the interesting things about the law of Moses is uh, before they didn't have inheritance for women. But with the law of Moses, inheritance was opened up for women. Uh, they could inherit property and, and dispersive property. That was a new thing in that culture. They had redemption of property. If you get into debt and you're bankrupt and you lose your property, how can you get it back? Is there a way to get it back? Well, they made room for that. There were borrowing and lending regulations. Uh, these were to, to keep people from becoming indebted perpetually. Uh, there were laws about business ethics. Uh, listen, if you had a grocery store uh, as such, and you had a scale, the scale had to be regulated properly. It had to have just weights. You, if you had a bushel basket, it had to contain a bushel. It couldn't have a false bottom in it. Uh, God gave laws to Moses, to the children of Israel, to make sure that their business practices were fair and ethical. There was provision made for the poor. <clears throat> in those days, uh, they had poor people like they do today, people who had fallen on hard times. And uh, if they were harvesting crops uh, and they were going through collecting the wheat, they weren't to clear cut it. They weren't to cut everything down. They were, they were to leave the corners and the edges because the poor could come and collect grain so they could have bread and not die. And there were other regulations for the poor. Uh, there were safety laws. We don't think about that, but uh, in the law of Moses in the Old Testament, they had a law about if you have a house and you have a roof area, you had to build a banister around the roof so somebody wouldn't fall off it and die. Uh, those are what we would call city codes today. Uh, in the Old Testament, there were city codes. Jesus gave them city codes to live by so people would be safer in their environment. Uh, there were family laws, uh, spousal rights, family rights, parental rights. These things were codified in the law. There were also laws regarding the military and how they were to conduct themselves. So there were many, many different civil laws. And if, if we read through them, we find they make a lot of sense. 
Uh, they're just good practical laws. But then they also had some interesting things, uh, at least to us, uh, cleanliness and dietary laws. And these are the ones that I think cause a lot of the uh, problems today with people and and some of the uh, disputes that people have. Uh, There's a certain uh, degree of misunderstanding about these. These cleanliness and dietary laws were a mixture of common sense health issues and training on things that are clean and unclean for spiritual application. Now, sometimes these are hard to distinguish. Now, for, for one thing, uh, they had clean and unclean animals. Uh, for instance, a pig, swine, they were unclean. Now, there is a good real deal of reasoning why this might be. Uh, in those days, uh, as it has been in some areas and cultures, they would feed the hogs just anything they had. Sometimes they would feed them other hogs that had died. Uh, they would feed them just anything. Uh, and, and for some reason, hogs in particular uh, would carry certain diseases and carry certain parasites that if you ate the meat, it might infect you as well. Now, if you don't regulate the hog industry properly, uh, there's problems with that. By the way, I love pork. I eat bacon. I eat ham. But guess what? I cook that stuff. I don't eat it raw. Uh, why? Because I, I know that. Uh, But now they had dietary restrictions. For instance, this is something that I would have had trouble with. Uh, You can't eat shrimp. Uh, The fish had to have scales, seafood like oysters and things like that. Can't eat those. But now there's also a good reason for that. Uh, Because of the lack of sanitation that existed in those days, all of this stuff would drift into the lake and all the bottom feeder type of creatures in the sea would often be infected with every kind of toxin you can imagine and they would have problems. Now, I grew up along the coast, uh, Mobile, Alabama, and that's a big fishing area, a big seafood industry, and there are certain times of the year where you're not allowed to harvest oysters. It has to be only months that have an R in them. You know, you have September, October, November. <clears throat> when you get into months that don't have an R, the, the summer months, you don't get the oysters. Why? Because they can have toxins in them. Uh, I had some friends that, uh, that uh, they caught oysters, and they also uh, caught crabs and, and sold them. And uh, there are certain times of the year when in Mobile Bay, when the toxin levels were high, that if you ate uh, a good number of of crabs or soft shell crabs, as they sometimes do, uh, you might have something that was similar to LSD get into you. And you would dream in color. Uh, You would have all kinds of wild thoughts in your head because these toxins would get into your mind and and you would have that problem. And so they have to find out, let's don't do that. (laughs) Now, uh, what God said for the children of Israel, just don't eat those things. They didn't have the scientific ability to monitor it and clean it. So Jesus gave them rules so that they would be healthier than the people they were around. Now, let's understand something. Nobody's perfect, and no nation is perfect, and no culture is perfect. But what God was trying to do with Israel is say, this is my nation. These are my people, and I've given them my laws. And when they keep my laws and I bless them, they're doing better than the rest of the nations who don't have this. This was God trying to reach the world by nation building and showing them what he could do through Israel. Now, they failed terribly at it. But that was the idea, and that was the uh, testing that was being done upon humanity through them. So they had uh, all of these things regarding uh, uh, cultural laws. Let's talk about cultural laws. I want to skip those, okay? Now, these were laws that either reflected the common moral codes of the day or the geographic culture uh, that were either good or needed improving. Now, okay, let's, let's remember When God took the nation of Israel, they were in a cultural setting. They had things that were ingrained into them, into their psyche, into their world, and that was part of who they were. What do you do with these people? How do you guide them? How do you bring them to a better place? Well, you have to take them where they are. You have to meet them where they are. And that's what God always does. Listen, when he cleaned you, didn't he start where you were? Didn't he patiently work with you? Didn't he say, okay, this is what you need to pray about. This is what you need to work on. God didn't just transform you in one second when you got saved. Uh, Listen, I've been saved uh, many years now, and God is still working on me, still revealing things to me that I need to work on. Uh, Why? Because I'm an unfinished project, just like you. So God started with Israel where they were. So they had regulations on servitude. They had slavery in those days. They had servitude. 
God says, here's how you don't treat a slave. Here's how you do treat a slave. Here's the people you can make slaves. Here's the people you can't make slaves. God had rules on that. There were regulations on polygamous families. People had more than one wife. And so they, God said, okay, if you, if you have more than one wife, you treat all of them decent. You treat their children decent. You, you be good. You be, uh, be a good man who has more than one wife. Uh, he also said, don't multiply it. Don't go crazy about it. I wish Solomon had listened. Amen. 700 wives and 300 concubines. He, he's nuts. I mean, but look, and they led him away from God, the Bible says. He should have listened to what the, the word of God said. So there were regulations uh, about the laws of hospitality. You know, they had a thing then that if, if your enemy came to you and claimed sanctuary because he was thirsty and he was on a journey and he needed help, you were supposed even to help your enemy at that time. This was something in the culture. It's, it's still true in the Arab culture today. Uh, and so the children of Israel had that understanding that you are to even treat your enemies kindly and with courtesy. Uh, I was watching one of these uh, uh, animal shows on TV, which I love to watch, and it was about prairie dogs. All about prairie dog culture. It's fascinating. They've got their own language. They've got their own culture. They've got their own rules that they go by. And uh, on the walk that I used to take along Spring Creek Trail, there were several of these little prairie dog communities. And sometimes my wife and I would just take a, a bench and sit and watch them. And, you know, they say that these prairie dogs have a warning that the sentinels, they're the ones that are always up looking around like that. This little guys poke their head up looking around. And, and when they see something, they go, cheep, 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 like that. And that means a hawk is coming. Or if they have another sound for a fox is coming. And they have another sound for a, a person, a human being is coming. And the other prairie dogs know which is which. And then what was really humorous to me is when the danger had passed, he would go, eh, like that. And everybody would go back to feeding and they wouldn't be so particular, you know. They understood this. But there was one interesting thing about these prairie dogs that when a fox was in the area or some predator and they got in their little frady holes to hunker down and, and not be eaten, if a rabbit jumped in their hole, they would allow the rabbit to stay there. Now, a rabbit doesn't belong in a prairie dog's hole. But in a time like that, they were courteous enough to let the rabbit hide from the wolf or the fox or the hawk or whatever it was until the danger had passed, and then they would kick it out. Now, this is an interesting thing that, that there is a law in nature that even someone who's not part of your tribe, part of your clan, or even part of your species to be kind to them when there's danger around. And so in the Bible, there were laws about hospitality. All right, there were rights to eat of crops along the roadside. Now, uh, if you were walking along and you were hungry and there was a man who had a field over here and say the field had all this grain, you could go and take your handfuls of grain and you could rub it out and you could eat it. Jesus did that. Jesus and his disciples did that. They were walking along, taking the grain, rubbing it out and eating it. And somebody said, you're eating with unwashed hands. That's not uh, righteous. You're a sinner. You're eating with unwashed hands. And Jesus had to give them a lesson uh, in biology uh, and say that you don't defile your soul by eating with unwashed hands. Uh, the truth is we eat dirt every day. It doesn't defile us. Uh, Jesus said, you, uh, you hypocrites, you strain out a gnat so it won't get into your beverages. They would strain their beverages so a gnat wouldn't get in. And then you turn around and swallow an elephant or a camel. Uh, and so Jesus called him on that. Now, the laws of hospitality and the right to eat of crops along the roadside. I like that one in particular. When I would go and visit my relatives in Florida years ago as a boy, uh, there were places where there were oranges growing everywhere. Uh, entire neighborhoods had been built in what used to be orange groves. And if I was walking on the sidewalk, I could just reach up and pluck a beautiful orange that was hanging right off the tree and eat it as I went along. Everybody did it. it was, there was more. They were on the ground. There was more than you could deal with. It wasn't stealing. It was considered fair game. If you could reach up from the sidewalk and grab it and eat it, it was yours. Well, that's how Jesus made the nation of Israel. If you're walking along on the highway or the pathway and there's something close by, you can eat it. This is a community. You get to have some help along the way. All right. How to dress and how to groom oneself. You can go through and read it. There's things in the Bible, listen, about how men should dress. 
And one of the things that men were supposed to do is put this little blue fringe on their robes, on their clothing, to remind them to be holy before God. And so when they would walk around, somebody would ask you, why do you get that fringe on your, on your robe for? And he said, well, that's to tell me to be holy before God. And it was something to remind them about that. God even told the children of Israel, the men, how to wear their beards. He didn't want them to have a weird beard. He wanted to have a normal looking manly beard. So don't do weird things with your beard. Uh, why did God care about that? Well, the, in, the, in the pagan cultures in which they lived, they had all kind of priests, all kind of fads, all kind of styles of things going on. And listen, God wanted his men in the nation of Israel just to look like natural, well-groomed men, not to have elaborate, weird hairstyles and do that. That, that was part of the law. Now, is that binding today? Uh, no, that was part of the ceremonial law for the Jews, but that's what they had. All right, so the cleanliness and dietary laws, uh, there was also no eating of meat torn by beasts. Now, think about that. Why would that be in the law? Uh, I sometimes ask myself, now, I don't always get an answer. I don't always uh, know why. But I've got an idea about this one, and I'll share it with you. Predators single out of a herd the ones that are weak, the ones that are diseased. And sometimes that wolf or that bear can smell the disease. They can smell the ones that are wasting, the ones that have a, a medical problem or, or a health problem, and those are the ones they'll go after to take out. So if you eat meat that was torn by beast, you might be eating something with mad cow disease. You might be eating something with wasting disease. So it was good sense if that one couldn't outrun the deer, uh, run the wolf, or if that one couldn't outrun the, the bear, maybe that's not the healthiest choice to eat. It's just a practical thing. So they had laws concerning that. Uh, disease control. Uh, listen, there are entire chapters in the Bible on dealing with just one disease, the disease of leprosy. It was a plague. It was something to deal with. And so they were told how to diagnose it, how to recognize it, how to deal with it, how do you know when somebody is cured of it. All of this was just medical information given, and it stands up to reason today as well. They also had rules and regulations in the cleanliness and dietary laws on how to mitigate mold and mildew. I don't know if any of you have ever had mold in your house. It's a deal. You've got to deal with it. Uh, they had mold and mildew then as well. Sometimes it may be a garment. Sometimes it may be their bedding. Sometimes the, uh, the mold or the mildew might be in the wall of their house. And there are entire chapters given to the uh, mitigation of mold and mildew, how to deal with disease. This is part of the law of Moses as well. Also, there are rules and regulations of the, about the preservation of fruit trees and wildlife. When they went into an area, they were not to clear cut out the fruit trees. If there's a tree that produces fruit or, or almonds or whatever it was, leave it. Now, that's just good common sense, but they did that. Now, why, why were all these rules there? Well, you see, the heathen nations among whom they were to dwell, they made all kinds of mistakes. They did all kinds of things that were wrong, and they got all kinds of diseases, and they got unhealthy, and they didn't live right. God was trying to demonstrate to the world, this is how people can live if they live right with my blessing. And so this was the purpose for all of these laws. Now, the question is, so did the New Testament negate all of these laws? If not all, which laws still apply? How do we know which is which? Is the Old Testament no longer a source of governing our behavior as Christians? Is there still value in studying the Old Testament? These are the questions we need to come to, and they're not quick and easy answers. It requires some work. It requires some study. So what we're going to do now, after we've gotten a little bit of an understanding of what the Old Testament law of Moses was all about, let's ask ourselves some questions. How is it possible to err? How is it possible to make a mistake about how we deal with the law of Moses? Well, there's two errors. There's two errors uh, that you can make. First of all, it is an error to mandate all the Old Testament laws. That's a big statement. It's an error to mandate the Old Testament laws and bring them over into the New Testament. That is called legalism. And they dealt with that in the first century of the church. There were those who believed that you should do that. 
they believed that all the new Christians who came in, regardless of whatever Gentile nation they came in, had to become Jews and had to be kosher and had to follow the ceremonies and keep the feasts and all of this. Well, that's an error. That's not biblical. It's called legalism. But here's another error. It is an error to negate all the Old Testament laws because some of those Old Testament laws are universal laws. They existed before the law of Moses and they exist after the law of Moses and there will never be a time when breaking those laws is all right. So that is libertinism. That is taking liberties with God's truth. So in order to avoid either extreme, and here's how this is going to become a two-parter because there's no way we're going to answer all these questions today. In order to avoid either extreme, we must ask three important questions. First of all, Question one, how do we determine what parts of the law were ended with the New Testament? That's a fair question, isn't it? Is there a formula? If so, what is it? How do I know what parts of what God told Moses to tell the nation of Israel are for us today as well? All right. Question number two, and this is important. How do we maintain harmony with other Christians who differ about such matters? Because some differ. They have a different understanding of it. How do we get along with them? How do we live together as Christians? For instance, with some Jewish believer who believes that, uh, that there's certain things he shouldn't do. How do, we, how do we deal with that? And the early church had to uh, come to grips with that. And then question three, and I think this is something that we're going to spend a little time on. I believe it's important. What lessons may apply to us from the non-binding parts of the law? Now, that's something we Christians sometimes fail in, that there are lessons God gave us in the Old Testament. They're not binding on us today, but it's important that we understand it and apply the lessons to our lives to live righteously before God. Maybe it's not a law. Maybe it's not something that we're sinning if we don't do it exactly that way, but maybe it's something we should pay attention to and live in the wisdom of it today. There are a lot of things like that in the Bible that are given for our good. Now let's talk about question number one. Question number one is how do we determine what parts of the law were ended with the New Testament? What parts of the Old Testament law of Moses were ended in the New Testament? And is there a reliable method for determining this? Well, I'm going to give you a method that I believe is reliable. First of all, ask this question. Is the Old Testament law specifically repealed in the New Testament? Is it repealed specifically by name in the New Testament? If so, then it's out. All right? Now, God told the children of Israel to keep the Sabbath. And that was a law. It was important. It was mandated. And judgment would come if they did not. But in the New Testament, we are taught that Jesus is our Sabbath. He has kept it. And we are not to be judged regarding the keeping of the Sabbath days. And by the way, the Sabbath is what day? Saturday. It never was Sunday. And yet there are entire European Christian nations, or, or denominations rather, that, that say that the Sabbath is Sunday. The Sabbath is not Sunday. It was never Sunday. It's not Sunday now. The Sabbath was Saturday. And guess what? It started on Friday night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Friday night starts the Sabbath and, and Saturday night ends it. And so that was the Sabbath. And that was for the Jews. It was never imposed upon the Gentiles except by a, a rare few that the Apostle Paul withstood and spoke against. And so we, uh, that's an example of something that was part of the law, but is specifically mentioned as not being part of the New Testament. I'll give you another one. This whole idea of certain foods you can eat and certain foods you can't eat. This is specifically mentioned in the New Testament as not binding. The Apostle Paul said, the meat's for the belly and belly for the meat. So let no man judge you in what? Meat or drink. So eat your bacon sandwich. Eat your ham. It's okay. It's not a sin. Uh, there are things that you might do differently in a Muslim community or in a Jewish community, lest you offend them. But generally speaking, these things are not sinful. It's not carried over into the New Testament. So is the Old Testament law specifically repealed in the New Testament? Well, if it is, then you have your answer. That means it's no longer binding. It, it, it's, it's just math. Okay. Secondly, is the Old Testament law specifically repeated in the New Testament? 
Now, part of the Old Testament law was thou shalt not kill. It is specifically repeated in the New Testament not to kill. This is something that is carried over in full force. Uh, the Bible says don't bear false witness. In the New Testament, there are, uh, it is repeated not to bear false witness, not to lie. In the Old Testament, thou shalt not commit adultery. Do we then say, well, that's the law of Moses. In the New Testament, I can commit adultery if I want to. No, the Bible says do not commit fornication, do not commit adultery. So if those things in the Old Testament are repeated in full force in the New Testament, then they are in. Now, this isn't hard. It's not difficult. And, and all we have to do is read the Bible and find out what these are. But listen, there are teachers today, false teachers today, who want to relegate the entire law of Moses, including the Ten Commandments, to the Old Testament and make it no longer authoritative on Christians today. This is the error, this is the heresy that we've been talking about. There are things that God gave Moses that are universal. They carry over into the New Testament, and the New Testament repeats them exactly and specifically, and Jesus himself taught them, and the apostles taught them, and they are part of the New Testament faith. Why would a preacher of God's Word, why would a follower of Jesus Christ try to make some things that Jesus calls a sin and say they're not a sin? The only reason that would be is to gain popularity with this sinful world. And to make Jesus more popular, more likable, and to make the church uh, more numerous. Uh, I believe that that is exactly the opposite of what Jesus would have us do. Uh, I'm going to stop. I'm going to put this on hold. We're going to get to it next week. But just let me uh, mention this, okay? Jesus wrote seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. Jesus wrote some epistles, if you will. Jesus wrote some letters. And if you study those letters... If you study the letters of Jesus, letters that Jesus wrote to specific pastors at specific churches, every one of those letters was written by Jesus to this church. And in most of these letters, what we find out is if they had followed what Jesus told them to do, if they had done what Jesus told them to do, their church would have been smaller. Their church would have been less full. Why? Because he says, you have some in there that do this. Deal with it. You have some in there that say this. Deal with it. You have some in there that practice this. They should be removed. Jesus was not about building large numbers as much as he was about building true disciples. And he did that in his own ministry. And he did it in his seven letters. And that's what the Holy Spirit does today. If your goal is to gain a large number, here's how you do it. Entertain them to death and take out all the negatives of the Bible you can and deal with the 5 or 10% of things that they will allow you to teach without writing you off and you can grow a large number of people and they'll love you. They'll think you're great. They'll call you America's pastor. They'll pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars. They'll let you drive a fancy car and live in a mansion as long as you do that. But if you teach and preach the true word of God, every bit of it from Genesis to Revelation, and preach and teach as Jesus would have you do, listen, you're not going to get those large numbers. Now, the last question, and we're going to deal with this more next week. What lessons may apply to us from the non-binding parts of the law? Now, this is something that I think we Christians sometimes fail at, is we tend to write off the Old Testament write off the dietary laws, write off the ceremonies, write off all the civil laws and saying that doesn't appeal to us, that doesn't apply to us today. But listen, while it may not be binding, there's some sense to be found in it. There's some wisdom to be found in it. When Jesus, who wrote the Old Testament, by the way, comes down on a subject and said, here's what I'd like you to do, then maybe we ought to pay attention to it. Maybe we ought to give it some weight. It doesn't mean we have to make it a law. It doesn't mean we have to bind ourselves with it. It doesn't mean we have to get on to other people if they don't do it. But it does mean maybe we ought to pay attention to it and give it some, some credibility. So this part of the formula is helpful when we're dealing with these things. Now, let's close with Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 26. The Holy Spirit in this passage of Scripture is saying this, but before faith came, now faith came through Jesus Christ, before faith came, we, that is we, the nation of Israel, we the Jews, 
were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now, let me explain what, it, what he's saying. What is being said here is that the law served a purpose. It held us together. It kept us in the faith. It kept us in an understanding until the true faith came through Jesus Christ. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Now, what the Bible is saying here is that the Old Testament law taught us. It guided us. It prepared us for Jesus. Okay? That we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, what this means is you don't work your way to heaven. You can't. They couldn't and you can't. You don't become right with God by living perfectly. You can't and, and you, you, you're not going to be able to do that. You come to Christ by faith. He saves you by your faith that you place in his cross. And that is makes you, that's what makes you born again. So the schoolmaster brought you to Christ. Now you don't need the schoolmaster anymore. We don't need the ceremonies. We don't need the sacrifices. We don't need all the law, that law of Moses is, is done. It was temporary. It was just to bring us to Christ. The reference goes back to the days in which royal households would have, for instance, a child, and he would perhaps be the heir, the heir of the household. And so they would have a, a, a trusted person to be his tutor, to be his mentor, to be his schoolmaster, uh, his mentor. And he would be under the care of that individual until he was old enough to be presented to the king. And then when he was presented to the king, the schoolmaster's role was over. He had to find some other student to teach. He was now presented to the king. Listen, the Old Testament brought us to the New Testament. And through Christ, he kept the law. He kept the dietary law, the civil law, the ceremonial law, all the law, the moral law, kept it perfectly and died in our place because he is the only righteous person who ever lived, the only one who kept the law, and he kept it for us so that we then are free from all those rules and regulations of the law, but not free from God's moral laws, not free to do just as we please. We are now governed by the law of love, which means that some of the things that Moses said we double down on even more. Some of the things that weren't even considered that big a deal in the Old Testament are a bigger deal now because love demands that they be. So we'll get into more of that next week as we study. Dear Father, it's our prayer that we will be more like Christ and less like the world. Lord, that we would be following Him by imitating Him and acting as He acted and, and thinking as, as He taught us to think. And Lord, I pray that as we read the Old Testament, we would read it with an understanding mind that while all of this was not written uh, to us specifically, it was written for us specifically. And we have an understanding of it and we should apply it and live it as best we can. I pray, Lord, that we will not be guilty of trying to find loopholes in God's word so that we can live a less than holy life. But Lord, that we will also not be guilty of legalism and hypocrisy uh, Lord, that we would be understanding that, that we are free from all of those rules and regu regulations of the law that are not repeated in the New Testament. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.